Uh, what I'd like to do now, uh, the next segment, is to walk you through the timeline and give you, try to give you a better uh, and clearer understanding of what our crews were experiencing as they arrived and, and as they deployed and to go into operations. So again, um, this incident was the beginning of the dispatch was at 1446, uh, just shy of three o'clock in the afternoon on that Sunday. Uh, I'm not gonna read this verbatim. Uh, I don't like to read slides, but there's a running order. We've already showed you that and it did come in uh, as a structure fire with people inside. Not one, but plural. Uh, and of course that raises everybody's anxiety um, and it is go, go, go. And quite honestly, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna be brutally honest with you. I don't wanna be necessarily politically correct, but when we have a report of people trapped in a structure fire, we do everything faster. And we did that day. Um, but again, we also had uh, ice, ice and snow conditions as well. But, uh, we responded with that uh, normal sense of urgency that we do. And we were very prepared to do what we had to do when we arrived. Um, now I'm gonna make a note here just for clarity's sake. Uh, there were a number of typical first two companies that were out of service when this alarm was dispatched. Um, Engine 7, Squad 7, Rescue Transport 6, they were all on EMS runs. Had they been in service, they would have been, and in quarters, they would have been sent to this incident. Um, Engine 5 and Truck 5 were, uh, they were, they're our downtown company. They were out of service in quarters, uh, rehabbing from a dive exercise, training exercise, and were not sent to the incident. Um, and as you'll see as we go through this, we are, we are being totally transparent. Um, when things go bad, they go bad in a big way and they go bad in a hurry at all levels. And, and this incident is not unique to that typical uh, scenario. So three minutes later, uh, as you heard, Engine 19 was added to supplement the absence of Rescue 6. At 1452 is when Battalion 1 reported smoke showing from two blocks away. And technically, he was, a, he was a little bit further than two blocks away, as you'll see in a map later. He was on uh, the King Bridge crossing the Maumee River. When he looked to his right, what he saw off in the distance against a gray winter sky was a fairly large column of dark gray, almost black smoke, but mostly gray, large column. And it was moving with some intensity. Uh, that was essentially four city blocks away. You heard him call engine three. Do you see the smoke off in the distance in the area of this fire? You heard the lieutenant say, we're looking. He never sees it. After he comes off the King Bridge, he makes a right on the front street, paralleling the river, heading for Magnolia Street. He makes another report of seeing the smoke two blocks away to dispatch. Okay, so that's significant. Let's understand, this is our first learning point here. Let's understand what that smoke means. Okay, now in our department, we are teaching every one of our members, from youngest to oldest, to become as much as possible an expert in reading smoke. How many have taken Dave Dodson's class on that? It's absolutely essential. Heavy, gray smoke, under pressure, a column of smoke that you can see basically four city blocks away. <coughs> When you arrive and see the building it's coming out of, okay, that smoke means that there are superheated flammable gases burning in that, in, or in that building. That's what's creating that type of smoke. Hot, ready to flash over gases, okay? So that becomes significant because in a few minutes, or in a minute or so when they arrive, conditions are a lot different, and that's significant. So a minute later, <laughs> Engine 3, Battalion 1, Engine 13 and Rescue 13, and Engine 6 arrive on scene. They arrive like a parade up Magnolia, one behind the other. There's another video of that parade of rigs coming in that we don't have time to show. But they arrive essentially at the same time. So as they were coming up Magnolia to the intersection of Huron where the building sits, it would be on their right. Um, and they lay first eyes on the building. You saw the building. Okay, remember what it looks like from the Charlie Delta corner across that small gravel parking lot. 
All right, every single member that arrived and first laid eyes on that building said that the smoke, all of the smoke that they saw was coming from Division Two. There was no visible smoke noted coming from Division One from that angle. All of it was on Division Two. Everyone agreed on that. The smoke that they said they saw, white, white, gray, billowing, pumping smoke. That's some of the ways they described it in their statements. Nobody saw any active fire. That observation led all of them to believe that the fire was on Division Two. So that's what they start thinking. Okay. The smoke that they see as they lay eyes on the building is quite a bit different than the smoke battalion one saw from two to four blocks away. It was now comparatively much lighter, under less pressure, and everybody, just about, I shouldn't say everybody, just about everybody on that initial response, all said something like, it didn't look that bad. <laughs> 